Hi, my name is Ben Atkinson and welcome to the Functional Health Podcast. I interview some of the leading voices in nutrition and lifestyle medicine, and I will share with you their stories, their expertise, and their advice, shedding light on the industry from each of their perspectives to help improve your health from today. This week, I'm delighted to share with you my conversation with Mark Collinsworth. Mark is the CEO of the Nutrition Society, and today we dive into the topic of building and cultivating resilience, specifically resilience to stressful and emotional situations. So without further ado, Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It is such a pleasure to have you on, sir. Um, I've done several podcasts recently focusing on immunological and hormonal resilience, Um, but I'm very glad to speak to you today on the topic of emotional and stress resilience, and I believe that's kind of very much nicely tied in with mindset. To orientate everyone and provide a degree of context as to why we're speaking about this today, it would be great to have an overview of your background and how you got where you are today. Yes, indeed. Um, um, my career um, started at a very early age. I left school at the age of 16 with just a pocket full of the minimum qualifications. Um, school for me was sport, not education. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then quickly realized the error of my ways. So used my salary from my insurance clerk job to go to night school and got my A-levels. Um, and then I um, uh, and then began a kind of banking career for a while, which I didn't enjoy. Um, there were all kinds of ethical challenges for me there. I didn't know I had such ethics uh, until you start having to sell things to people that you don't quite believe in. Um, and about a couple of years into that, I, I kind of went back to my roots and thought, what do I really want to do? And I'd always wanted to be in the military. Um, so I applied uh, to become an officer in the Royal Air Force, um, went for selection arguably probably way too quickly and um, failed selection got rejected and got a very blunt letter saying thanks very much but no thanks um, but i persisted and um and said i really think this is what i want to do they tested my resilience early on and said <laughs> come back in two years time which is their way of saying if you really want it you'll wait two years um, so i trained hard over those two years i volunteered with Air Cadets and various other organizations. Went back two years later, sailed through selection, and went off to the Royal Air Force College at Cranwell, trained as an officer cadet, graduated, and then had a 16 year career in the Royal Air Force, um, serving all over the world. I spent most of my time overseas. And then towards the end of my 16 years, when the option comes up to stay. Um, the system is a little strange. If you if you reach senior officer rank, which is squadron leader, um, you can automatically extend that 16 year point to your 55th birthday. Right. Um, okay. Um, and you have that awkward moment in your life where you think, could I get a second career at 55, or could I, as I was at the time 40 years old, could I get my second career at 40? So I leave at the 16 year point. Um, and I I was taking an MBA through the Open University to continue to upgrade my um, uh, kind of uh, relaxed approach to education, um, <laughs> or less formal, let me say that, although the Open University was very challenging. And that MBA really opened my eyes to what potentially is out there, and I, I developed a real interest in, in non-profit organizations uh, through case studies there. Uh, so I decided to leave. I was stationed in Canada at the time, so I stayed in Canada as an immigrant and did the most ridiculously stressful thing imaginable that I moved to the other side of Canada, to Calgary, to a city I'd never been to before, um, a city where I knew nobody, I had no network, and I had about enough money to live on for six months. And I bought a house and started again. And I went from a command of 130 odd people and 30 million pound budget in the Air Force uh, to a eventually um, my first job uh, as executive director of a program um, with three staff and £250,000 budget. And I had to fundraise nearly all of that <laughs> and sweating every month over whether there was enough money to meet the payroll. So that was the beginning of, a, of one of those crossroad moments in your career where you go backwards to mm-hmm. get forwards. Um, and then progressed uh, through a number of roles with the um, 
uh, with the non-profit sector in Canada and eventually um, kind of burnt out in a way um, in my last role with the Nature Association and um, wanted a bit of time out. I mean, I've been working since I was 16 mm. um, and I was just tired. Um, and I later found out there was some, um, uh, some emotional issues there around, um, around uh, depression and, and, and that transition from the military is not easy when you've been in for 16 years. Um, and I got offered a lecturing job at the University of Winnipeg um, on leadership, which was my, always has been my interest and hobby. So I wrote a curriculum, which I'd never done before. I taught adult education, which I'd never done before. Had two fantastic years with them. And then came back, um, came back to England. And um, again, back to a country where I'd pretty much lost my network because I'd been away for so long. Had to build again, move back in with my parents, which everybody does in their 50s. Um, and then found the Nutrition Society job. Again, just as you're beginning to self-doubt, you made the right decision. Along came a great role. Um, that was 2014, and I've been CEO of the Nutrition Society ever since. And I think I can say, you know, if you look back over that very weird career path, I'm now in a job that I think I was always meant to be in. You know, it was that phrase that people say, find something you love, and then it won't feel like it's a job. It's a life. Mm -hmm. And I now really do think I have a life. And working at the Nutrition Society is a key part of that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have work-life balance. I just have life now. It's happens. Well, I am so pleased to hear that. Um, it sounds like you've had some very challenging experiences, some that you've been uh, put in and some that you've actually chosen to take on yourself, as it were. Um, and having had the pleasure of working with you and for you, I know all too well that you have a, a very impressive resilience to stress, or at least that is my perception right um, and I want to focus on first if this is okay with you your your time in the army so the first question I'd like to ask you Mark is what were some of the stressful or challenging situations that you experienced that stood out for you I, I think I, 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 obviously there's there's very little I could talk about in terms of detail because mm -hmm, of course um, that sort of stuff is restricted but it was interesting over those 16 years you know I uh, I was stationed in Belize, um, running the kind of security operation there um, at the time of a hurricane season, when as a military person, you are given that very rare moment when you are given a green card, which is your um, license to shoot. And, and you're told you can shoot and you will shoot rioters and looters, um, civilians. That was an incredible wake up moment in your career when mm -hmm. that's, I joined in 1987 at the height of the Cold War to yes. fight the Soviet Union and now I'm in in Belize with these lovely people in the Caribbean and I'm being told actually I may have to shoot civilians uh, that was extraordinary um you know there's the the human tragedies um uh, in um in uh, in the Balkans during uh, Bosnia and Serbia um I I witnessed a you know the death of a colleague uh, in ER which I never wish to see again. Um, there was jungle warfare, you know, the survival training in the Arctic and in, um, in and in the jungle. Um, so there's and there was 9/11. Uh, ironically, you know, we're recording this on the 10th. You know, tomorrow is the anniversary of that. Mm -hmm. um, when I was stationed in Canada, when 20 odd aeroplanes descended out of the sky, um, and we were dealing with a, you know, a, another unique situation of global terrorism, but I've got hundreds and hundreds of international passengers stranded in the middle of Labrador who now don't know when they'll ever be leaving. Um, so there were all of those issues of stress management in a way, stressful situations. And, you know, in getting ready for this podcast, it's, it's often interesting to sit back and think, how did I cope with those? Because in anticipation, you'd be possibly asking the question. And I think it goes back to the training. Um, those that time at Cranwell, the six months you spent in officer training as a cadet to get ready, and they will not graduate you unless you're ready, mm -hmm. because the authority, the power, um, the responsibility you get on day one of graduating is extraordinary. You you wouldn't get that in, in your first civilian job. So there's a great deal of trust, but of course a great deal of training goes into that. So I think there's a competence issue that comes from training and experience. 
broken mind that you just you build yourself up or you are built up initially in training to be able to be resilient. I mean, nobody knows how you're going to react until it happens. But if you can train as much as possible for the worst case scenario, you know, so we would, it would be initially, it would be building up your physical resilience with, you know, the one mile run, the three mile run, the five mile run, the 10 mile, 10 mile run. Then there would be long marches, but you'd always come back at the end of the day. And then you would do a long march for hours and then find out you had to make a tent and sleep under the stars at the end of it and then do it all again the next day. So food starts to be deprived. And then you start to get mentally tired mm -hmm. because of the physical exhaustion. But it's layered and it's built up and it's built up. And eventually you build up to, um, to two weeks of living in a bare tent on limited rations, fighting a simulated um, war. Um, and in those days, it was preparing for a full-out nuclear uh, chemical uh, war. So a lot of time in big rubberized suits with respirators on, and, uh, and again, little sleep, lots of leadership opportunities. So you're under stress because you're commanding people for the mm -hmm. first time. And you find that because it's been layered and it's been progressive, you can deal with it. Um, the human body is extraordinary in what it can achieve. Um, it doesn't seem to remember pain that's that's probably my overriding issue. You know, that five mile run was agony. The next time you do it, it body doesn't remember it and it can run six miles. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're prepared to have the self or you build the self-discipline to keep going, the same thing seems to apply to the mind. But I think the um I mean the other thing that really comes home to you in particularly in officer training is that it's it's indoctrinated into you from day one that leadership is a privilege, to be in a leadership position is a privilege. And it's about others. You are the last person. You know, you don't eat until you've made sure that everybody else has got their meal. You don't go to bed till everybody else is safely uh, asleep. Um, so it's putting the interests of others first and s kind of subordinating your own interests. And that becomes part of who you are. You can't do that for six months initially. And then in fact, then for 16 years without it becoming a key part of your, of your personality and your, and your character. And I guess I was also very lucky to, um, um, to have rediscovered my, uh, my faith at that time. There was a, a moment um, uh, in training when we wandered unintentionally into a live firing exercise with the army. And we're all, and I was in charge of the team that, on that particular moment. We're all uh, uh, kind of digging holes in the ground as the bullets are ripping over our head. And we weren't supposed to be anywhere near this. We didn't even know what was going on um, because we were supposed to be training with blanks and uh, guns are going off and cannon and all that kind of stuff. Um, and everybody was looking to me because I am the leader for the day. Um, our instructor was over there on the telephone, mobile telephone uh, radio set, trying to work out what the hell was going on. Um, and I had a moment when I thought, everybody's looking to me, who do I look to if I'm in a leadership position? And there is nobody because that's why you're in a leadership position. And mm -hmm. at that moment, I, um, I, I remembered all of my, uh, my parents sending me off to Sunday school um, compulsorily. My family wasn't religious, but they wanted me to be. And I walked away at the age of 12. And now, you know, kind of 14 years later, I thought the only person I could turn to was God. And I prayed and had kind of inspiration but it was just having somebody else to talk to in my head mm -hmm. which is the essence of prayer um, and then clarity came and i was able to calm everybody down and take control and then the firing stopped because they worked out we were in the wrong place so the army was firing at us in the wrong place um, so a combination of training experience uh, physical mental robustness particularly through training um, and then that character that comes from that and, and you know, a little bit of faith which has stayed with me ever since. And I, if you look at all of those situations I've then been in with the military, um, immediate reaction is, who can I help? I've got to look after other people. That seems to be the, uh, you know, that seems to be the trigger. And then everything else shuts down because it's about other people and not yourself. Um, and if you can't do that, then you shouldn't be in those positions. Yes, I completely understand that. And, and that is, I think, an amazing trait to have as a human being, but also 
I can foresee people getting burnt out because they're looking after others and not necessarily looking after themselves. And I've heard this saying, which, which I really like, and you might disagree with it, but it's the idea that you can't give from an empty bowl. You need to build that resilience within yourself and build those reserves in order to help other people. What would you say to that? I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, and I think there's a tendency to think that everything in life is going to be fabulous. Um, and, and it isn't. It's extraordinary. If you could get through life with nothing ever going wrong, with no illness, no bereavement, no loss of a job, no setbacks, no failing an exam. Um, it's how you respond to those issues is where I think you put the food in the bowl, as, mm -hmm. you, would, as you would say. And that's what builds up that bank. Now, whether or not that could be drained eventually because you're overly pr uh, protecting others, I, I'm not so sure about that. I think... Um, um, I think self-restraint builds a strong character that that would be my that would be my thought um and embedded in that then of course are values that you will build up and you know values become your your foundation and as long as you believe you're doing things for the right reason you know it, it's basic human conduct you know, about being fair and uh, and respecting others and human dignity and uh and accepting responsibility, all of those issues build that mental resilience to me. And I don't think you could ever exhaust those. Um, you could give away, I mean, I'm looking around my drawing room where I'm sitting now, I could probably give away everything in here and still be a very happy individual. Like, <laughs> I'm a very, very happy individual because of all of my books I have around <laughs> me and my television and you know, my iPod, uh, ear pods and my iPhone and all of those things. But really, could I function without them? Yeah, of course I could. Um, so there's, there's, we live very comfortably, but I think we're not pushed enough to, um, to go without. And then if you weren't without, you realise actually it's nowhere near as bad as you, as you think. Um, I was told when I went into the military, they will try and break you. You'll get resilience because you will be broken down and then rebuilt. Yes. And I didn't find that. I, um, I found I was, I was pushed physically and mentally. But they didn't try to break my spirit or break my character. They tried to improve it. So, yes, I was pushed to my limits, if that's what breaking you is. But I came back much stronger as a result of it, because every time they pushed you, you found you could go further. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely fascinating. And it's amazing to, to hear that your training had such an, an effect in, in a real life situation like that. And it sounds like you were putting in some incredibly challenging situations. And to be quite honest, I wouldn't wish them upon anyone else. But it's great to hear that you've uh, had so many key learnings from that. And it sounds like it's played into many other aspects of your life. The, the, the issue with that, I think, coming back to that idea of the empty bowl, when I had my kind of black moments after I'd left the really dark moments when I'd left the military and I'd, it'd been about six years I think five or six years after I left mm -hmm. I found I was getting increasingly tired um, but I was also um, I mean eventually I was declared uh, assessed to be clinically uh, depressed um, and the people I worked with to get me through that said um, the key thing you're struggling with and one of the reasons I took a break from working is you are struggling with the the ethics and the behavior of of civilian life and the transition to that mm -hmm. from a very values-based ethical 16 years you spent in the military um, and there's a conflict there there's a tension there that i wasn't overcoming very well um, but once it was identified then you can put in place mechanisms to to get through that um, and then eventually um, you, you need to find the life and the world around you that matches your values. Um, or you can use your values to improve wherever you are. Um, you know, the Nutrition Society, when I joined seven years ago, the staff side, of it, the employment side, not the membership side, was not a values-based leadership world of empowerment in teams. Uh, it is now because I've been given the freedom by the Board of Trustees to build a values-based team and organization and it's taken mm -hmm. a long time you know people will eventually replicate i think most people will replicate 
the values they see around them if if they're inspired by them yes uh, but that won't happen in a day or a week or a month it's taken years um, and you've got to get the right team of people around you who will buy into those values i mean in a way that's what leadership is it's inspiring others to follow the path that you think is the right way to go there but you are leading them in a certain direction you picked on something there and i'd like to just um focus on it for a second the idea of leadership a lot of mm. people might be listening to this and haven't had the experience or the training that you have had to deal with stress in the way that you in the way that you can and being a leader i'm sure you know all too well that different people deal with different stresses differently <laughs> so yes. how do you begin to deal with those stresses or how do you nurture that kind of stress resilience in other people that you lead um, well, I think you lead by example, um, and and you talk about it. You don't try and, well, first of all, you've got to be genuine. You've got to be who you are. There's no point trying to fake it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you if you can build um, uh, a strong character a, a ethic in the team around you, simply by being genuinely who you are, and they can see, eventually they will see that that pays dividends, that you are happy and you are content and you are in control and you don't get stressed. You know, I remember, I might touch on it later, but um, I was in um, Heathrow Airport in a departure lounge um, flying to China about half an hour before takeoff. And I was with um, our science director. We were going together. It was her first major overseas trip. We were going to meet the Chinese um, and, and flying to Hong Kong to go on some different places. Anyway, with about half an hour to go to boarding, um, I got a text message from my wife saying, my father had just had a heart attack. Um, and, uh, and she was dashing over to the village where they lived to see what was going on. Um, and I looked at it and thought, well, I'm taking off to China in half an hour. There's, there isn't much I can do at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, and then 10 minutes later, I got another text message saying, sorry, your father has died. Um, uh, my science director told me at that point when I passed the news on to her that she said it was if something had switched I could see that you subtly changed and the slightly disconnected um, side of your personality the more um, she used the word cold but I don't I didn't think it was cold it was just um, you know, there's another role now I need to play and I need to switch to that role. I, I'm not now the CEO of the Nutrition Society flying to China. I am now the son of a widowed mother and the brother to a sister who's just lost her father. Mm -hmm. I need to go back home. I need to somehow get out of the wrong side of immigration <laughs> in Heathrow Airport. And my suitcase may still go to China without me if they can't get off the airplane. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't get emotional. I became quite logical and analytical and i briefed the science director in 20 minutes on and literally empowered her to go to china on her own um, and i wasn't conscious of that at the time it was only a couple of weeks later when she got back and we were debriefed on the trip that she uh, she remarked on that change that she'd seen in me but it was instinctive to me but that was inspirational i guess in a way to her mm -hmm. that that was my calmness under pressure that i didn't know i was exhibiting but somebody who was uh, seeing it felt it and saw it. Um, and that's what you want in your team, whether it's excitement, whether it's energy, um, whether it's making the right decisions for the right reasons, the ethical piece, um, whether it's the disciplinary piece where you do need to be tough and make difficult decisions. Um, if you're doing all of those on a really strong foundation of um, values that will guide you as you're wrong then you can't really go wrong and others will be inspired by that they will they will look to replicate that because mm -hmm. they'll see they'll see the right outcome from it so it's not That's... a training way i mean we we talk about values now yes. we didn't three four years ago i probably remember when you were there i was just beginning to have that sense that we needed to do something about teamwork and and values and principles underpinning it but it had always been there. I'd never spoken about it. Well, now, if you come up the stairs to the staff working area, there's a huge, great four foot by five foot panel on the wall. And it says our values are, and our values are listed on this board in 
you know, what we, every day we commit to the values of the team. You can't ignore it. You cannot walk into the office without <laughs> the values hitting you in the face. And that isn't some kind of, um, you know, Orwellian, um, you know, we're going to indoctrinate you and brainwash you into doing it. It's everybody wrote that statement together and they've bought into it. And, uh, and that's incredibly powerful. It's, you, you read these things in books and, and you study it in your MBA. And, and then when you actually get to do it and it works, it's not theory. Well, it's theory, but it's now in practice. Jeez, that's really exciting and to see that, to see it work. You know, that all the academic theory is correct. The research is correct. People will respond and you build great people and a great team as a result of it. I've heard this multiple times before. Like if you want to live by certain values, even in your own life, um, or in an organization, writing them down and formalizing them is one of the best ways to do that. To touch upon what you just said before around, um, I suppose, dealing with grief in some ways and that changing of, of the role, it's interesting that if you don't mind me calling it a coping mechanism, what happened is you became more logical and analytical. And I feel that I potentially do the same initially, that is, rather than become emotional, which is quite often um, what a lot of people just do naturally. What are the coping mechanisms that you've seen in others that you think would be good to replicate in those kinds of situations? Um, if there are any that are of note. Well, I mean, two, two spring to mind, and um, one might sound a bit cheesy, so I'll deal with the other one first. I, <laughs> I, was, greatly, I, was, I was greatly influenced um, uh, probably about 10 years ago by a book I found quite by chance uh, called The Power of Now mm. by Erkard Tolle, um, who at the depths of probably the lowest point in anybody's life, you know, out of work, an addict, on a park bench, um, turned around his uh, his life um, by, f by understanding that uh, the, there is an ego and there's a human body and the separation of the two and fighting the ego with your inner uh, with your inner soul but it was that idea that you live in the now that whatever may have happened 10 minutes ago happened and you can't change it mm -hmm. you cannot go back you can't rewrite history or influence how that happened or why it happened and something hasn't happened in the future yet because we're not there you might be able to influence it but you've got no guarantee of it um, so living in the now and dealing with the now is in a way the ideal coping mechanism because you take away those two stresses of permanently worrying about the future and stressing about things that happened in the past. Um, so that had a big influence on me because um, it was about the time I was just coming out of that um, uh, period of depression, the, the support work had worked. Mm -hmm. um, I had avoided, thank goodness, taking any kind of medication. I'd gone down the self-help kind of route. Um, and it really, it really turned me around to understand more about values and, and how to deal with it. But the other person who who just continues to inspire me, and I, I say this may sound cheesy, and that's Her Majesty the Queen. I look at that that life mm -hmm. you know, that she has lived where in her early 20s, everything was taken away from her. And, and, and admittedly, it came with great wealth and, and privileges. Um, but that life of service uncomplaining service is extraordinary and the dignity that she demonstrates um, and has demonstrated um, occasionally getting it probably slightly wrong but we're all human mm -hmm. um, but the dignity over the loss of, of Prince Philip recently the dignity with which she's been coping with the the Meghan and Harry issue the way she dealt with the death of her mother yes. um, and her sister um, there's a quiet, faith-based, I think, calmness there that I find very inspirational. And if um, uh, we were at a, a staff lunch yesterday and um, uh, my assistant, Anne, was trying to explain to a new member of staff um, uh, that they've only ever seen me lose my temper twice in seven years. Both of those incidents happened outside of the country. I think we were in Africa on both of them. Um, and she said, there's, there's, if he ever says the words, I'm disappointed, oh, you're in trouble. <laughs> if he says, you've let me down, 
oh, it's the end of the world. <laughs> so if the team would think that's about as extreme as I get, then I clearly am projecting <laughs> an, an aura of calm that when there is a crisis, you know, and COVID came around and you know, my board of trustees, I think would, would happily come on this podcast and say, the greatest thing that happened in COVID was that I guided them through those first couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, and we emerged from it a better organization and a stronger organization because I didn't panic. Um, and it just, I don't remember really thinking, oh, this is COVID, this is an emergency. I need to flick that switch and become this kind of a special person. It just, I just transitioned the organization on a calm, you know, values-based approach. And we, we emerged from it uh, stronger, but I think it inspired others not to panic. And, yes. And to, uh, uh, to just stay grounded as much as we, uh, as much as we could. When you spoke about um, the Queen handling things with dignity, are those qualities that you are trying to replicate in your own life? Yes. Yes. I would, when I started work on that idea of, of values based leadership, not just being in my head, but being on a notice board and being in people's annual reviews, um, uh, I went back to my. Uh, diaries that we used to have to compulsorily keep in officer training because mm -hmm. they were they were they were assessed mainly to uh, to train us to um, to write properly and write in the uh, in the military way of, of writing and I found in those um, uh, we we were developing values that would sustain us through our lives uh, so not just military values but good um, uh, what could I call them. Um, self-evident values that will stand the test of time. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I wrote them down just to remind me, um, but you know, there, there's a few of them. It's fairness, it's integrity, it's honesty, human dignity, service, excellence, courage, respect, responsibility, and self-discipline. Um, and over the six months, the focus was on building those within you in a sustainable way that they would stay with you for life. And I look at those now, 40 years later, 30 years later, and, and think, yeah, they still pretty much give and take, ebb and flow, but those are the core of, of who I am. And, and because they are enduring to me, they're guidelines for human conduct. Mm -hmm. They are self-evident. You know, and, and if everybody had those, because they've been around for thousands of years yes. in the very best leaders and the very best people and in the very best civilizations. Um, occasionally, perhaps just need to remind ourselves that that's who we are. That's the social human side of human beings. Mm -hmm. And they get lost sometimes in the noise. They get lost in politics. They get lost in unethical behavior. And we just need to find a way occasionally of just bringing those back, which is one of the reasons I put them up on the board. So occasionally... You know, if you're losing your way and you think, I just need to go out of the building and walk around the block for 10 minutes to calm down, you can just have a quick scan down that board and, again, ground yourself, come back to that, that center of gravity and calm down and find your true north and go back again. I, yeah. I mean, I was just thinking about what you just said in terms of those values. And I think if people can embody those they can also use them in a way to become a little bit more resilient it's something to fall back on during those stressful times like what is my purpose what are the values that i have and then i yeah. feel it's you would be become better at dealing with any stressful situation just by looking at those or reminding yourself of what you stand for and the values that you have yes yeah and if you particularly around decision making if you are making or in a position where you have to make decisions or lots of decisions or mm -hmm. key important decisions and you're not sure what to do, you look back at those and say, is the decision I'm making, is it fair? Is it honest? Is it going to respect human dignity? Um, and it helps you out of that you know, decision-making, uh, big decision. They, they aren't easy. And often in a leadership position, you're making it on your own. That's why you're in that leadership position. Um, so you, you need an ability to talk to yourself and talk through the pros and cons of that decision and, and basing it on values is a, 
yeah, it's an easy way to do it. It's an uncomplicated way, not easy. Yeah. It's an uncomplicated way of approaching very difficult situations. Yeah. Is that um, in a way that your code to live by, not just in the organization, but in your own personal life? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, it's only recently that I've had to really just think about it, um, mainly because I'm, I'm working on a, it's been an ambition to write um, a, a book about personal approach to leadership around a values-based approach to leadership. And I started on it in, uh, in, in January, mainly out of frustration at the incompetence um, of, of, of government officials dealing with COVID. I was so annoyed over Christmas um, and the new year at what was going on and, and just putting my head in my hands around uh, the frustration of what was happening. And I thought, well, why not write about it? At least it gets it out of your head and it gives you a chance to explore. And it's, it has become quite a uh, quite a, a journey. And I'm, I'm now at the stage where I've, I've got the structure around what values-based leadership means to me. And I now want to kind of progress the, uh, the project on uh, by going out and interviewing uh, other CEOs and senior leaders and, and getting their thoughts on how they approach certain issues uh, around this kind of values-based approach and see what I can learn from that. Mm -hmm. And perhaps they could learn something from from just being able to talk to somebody else about it and be questioned about it. So I'm building the list of people who very kindly agreed to to come and have a coffee with me and, and talk about it. I think it's going to be the most fascinating part of the exercise. The early part has mainly has been reading and catching up to date on books, um, and finding the, the key uh, writers that have inspired me over the years in leadership. Um, extracting from that probably where I've learned the most. And now let's go out and put that into practice and see what other people think. Yeah. That sounds yeah, absolutely so it, fascinating. And also yeah, quite so cathartic quite, that, if, you, if, you, um, if you're frustrated <laughs> over Christmas just to get it all out on paper. So it's only got worse since Christmas. And, uh, <laughs> now, I was, and I've started introducing leadership training uh, in the office, and I've got three of the kind of uh, uh, three of the staff now engaged in a. We've, we've had a two-hour session, and we're now doing smaller workshops around key issues. Um, and we debated in the first one, um, trying to put some real life to some of the theory. Um, and we were dealing with the health secretary who resigned um, over being caught breaking COVID mm -hmm. and, and use that as an interesting example where he said he was resigning because he broke the rules, but he didn't resign because he broke the rules. He resigned because he got caught breaking the rules. And there is a huge values based difference between those two statements Yeah, because he'd been breaking the rules for months and getting away with it. If he felt he was breaking the rules, you know, and you look at values of integrity, honesty, um, responsibility, uh, respect to the rest of the nation he should have resigned immediately he only resigned because he got caught and we had a fascinating debate then around um personal responsibility and leadership and when your whole authority could be undermined because you don't follow a values-based approach you lose all credibility when you put yourself first yeah. i love that i love that and I, I think that can apply to to everyone and that's um, a way of thinking that i've not really explored i think is the right way to articulate that um and something which i'm probably going to after this podcast is over <laughs> <laughs> well there'll be a book you can buy by the end of the year <laughs> yes, that's true <laughs> uh, and i will link to that in the show notes when it comes out for the listeners mark we've touched upon a few such scenarios already um in terms of challenging scenarios and I want to ask you probably quite a challenging question, or maybe it's easy for you. I'm not quite too sure yet. And it's like, if you could go back in time and meet yourself before facing some of these stresses. So there's two, which I just w would like to pick up on, um, or three, actually, if you don't mind. One is at the start of the army. And what advice would you give yourself? One is before the death of your father. Um, and the other one is before COVID-19 pandemic started. <laughs> so we'll start with the first one. So uh, I say so the army, the Royal Air Force, yeah, the Air excuse Force. me. Thank you. <laughs> so before I joined the Air Force, what would I have said to myself that I now know now 
yes. that I didn't know then. Um, I would have probably had a much stronger um, sense probably of self-belief, I think, than I had. I was very, very um, nervous joining the Air Force mm -hmm. because of my uh, almost kind of self-approach to education. Where, um, there were people at Cranwell who had got degrees in universities, they'd got A-levels, um, and I'd left school with five five GCSEs, which was the minimum requirement to get in, but nobody had that minimum requirement. Um, and I got my A-levels through night school, and, and I didn't have a degree, but I had work experience. Um, and we were talking before we came on about you know, that, that concept of imposter syndrome. And if, if ever I felt it, which luckily I've not really felt that in my life, um, that was the one time I probably did feel it. That first day when you walk in there with your civilian clothes on and um, you're transitioning to the military and there's all these what appear to be very confident people around you who've been to university and have great academic success, they're fit. Uh, they don't they haven't experienced some of the stresses of life that I've already had because I've been in the working environment um, and I already owned a house and I got married when I was 20 and all of those issues but they haven't got that um, and I felt very underconfident mm -hmm. um, and I didn't need to be because towards the end of those six months um, I was the second highest rated cadet on the course I was the person that people turned to when they wanted somebody to voluntarily lead something, whether it be the tennis club or the summer ball, it was me. Um, so there was something in me that I didn't know was there. Uh, and I didn't have the self-belief, the self-confidence to know that. So um, whether that would have made me overconfident going into travel, <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> that's another discussion. But yeah, the lack of self-belief, uh, I think I would have, hopefully I could have talked myself out of that. Um, the death of my the death of my father. Um, well, I, ironically, that um, that happened two years almost to the day that my brother had died, um, and uh, there seems to be a travel connection here because I just at the end of my first day of a two week holiday in Florence, I got a call saying my brother had, had died suddenly, and he's only two years older than me. I'm the middle child, um, and I left my wife in. The hotel in Florence and I flew back home I don't know why because um, uh, there's nothing really I could have done but, mm -hmm. but you, know, you immediately think there's um, not sure what I can do but I need to be there I need to help other people if I can that's my focus not self-interest um, and that was a real that was a real shock more so than my father my father was 89 and been ill for some time although the suddenness of it was a shock the fact it happened wasn't my brother who again was partially disabled and was not well but not life-threateningly unwell he just lived a very uncomfortable partially disabled existence mm -hmm. um, so to lose to lose your elder brother um, and suddenly you're not the young you're not the middle child who i don't know if you're the middle child but middle child sucks you, know, you get ignored <laughs> your entire life um suddenly i'm now the eldest son i've been promoted through a tragedy oh. um i've been very lucky that i'd gone through my entire life with no deaths apart from in the military mm -hmm. i've not lost a single relative i would still got both my parents i would still got my brother and my sister um and of course my grandparents had died but that was when i was a teenager so that was a long time ago and my three closest friends had all lost their fathers when they were 14, 15 years old. They lost their mothers when they were in their late 20s, early 40s. And here was I in my 50s, and I still have both my parents. Um, and you, you convince yourself that it's never going to happen. And then suddenly you get two tragedies um, within two years. Um, I think, how would I have been prepared for my brother's death? I, I don't... I, I really don't think I could have been prepared for that because it came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, I think I responded appropriately that I came back to help. I stayed a few days, about five days, and then I flew back to Florence to continue 
you know, the family holiday because my wife's parents' uh, sister were coming over from Canada and it was a big kind of uh, place in the Tuscany countryside we were moving into to spend a couple of weeks there. And I joined up with them. Um, and I think the try not to be overly kind of weepy now, but I was not emotional over both of those events. Never shed a tear for the loss of my brother. Never shed a tear for my father. My family asked me on both occasions to read the eulogy at both their funerals because they thought they would fall apart at the um, at the lectern and didn't break down, didn't, uh, and I, I, I don't know why that is. You know, um, is there a, uh, is there a unfeeling coldness in me or is it that self one of the aspects of being very resilient perhaps i am very resilient um is that extreme emotion or the display of any form of uh, emotion is um it's just not something that you're wired up to do anymore because you've got these coping mechanisms that doesn't explain why i weep every time i watch the sound of music but it's um, that's probably a different kind of uh, <laughs> uh, of emotion. But family-wise, you know, losing your brother, you yeah. know, going into that, and you no, know, I can't. That's weird. That's strange. Talking that through aloud, I can't well, think of what I would have prepared differently. Um, I think this is really interesting because I think it shows that you do obviously have extremely high stress resilience or emotional resilience in these circumstances, but also that when we were talking about different people deal with stressful situations very differently, that might be a coping mechanism, in which case you are very logical, you are very analytical. Um, And I think that probably is one of the ways that people can deal with these kinds of stresses and quite often um, emotional times. They do elicit emotions in people at some stage, um, but I guess whether you let that take over you or not. And I think that is resilience right because resilience is the opposite of fragility and i think quite often when people have these scenarios the loss of a loved one they become fragile and i think also it's important to outline that fragility is different from vulnerability people can be resilient but vulnerable oh, do yeah. you think though that there might be a i mean i became really quite quite strangely concerned um, uh, uh, after my father died that again this lack of emotion um, that my focus was on other people, sorting them out, helping them, being the rock that everybody is depending upon. Uh, was I building up? Um, that, that, uh, am I that source of, of boiling water with the lid that's kind of battering around, about to explode? Because I'm, I'm holding in all of these mm. emotional tensions and stress. Um, but I, you know, I test my blood pressure every month because I bought a machine for boots. I have my Apple Watch with my resting heartbeat on. Um, um, I, I don't feel stressed. There are no indicators from a health perspective that I'm stressed. Um, do you think, I mean, I'm, I consider myself quite physically fit. I can run 10K, and I'm 60 now. I can run 10K in, in under an hour. Um, I can recover quickly. I go to the gym two, three times a week for, for weight training. Um, I ski. Uh, I do all of these things that my father would never have done at 60. I mean, he was partially obese at that stage hadn't hadn't played sport for 20 years mm -hmm. so is there a is there a because you probably know more about these issues than me is there a a physical fitness element to this resilience that if you are physically fit it helps with the mental state as well that stops the stress building up or is it just a mental resilience issue well that is a really good question one which i probably won't be able to give a great answer but i will give it a go because i've thought about this before and i think they are interchangeable right if you have strong mental resilience then quite often you can push yourself physically greater than someone with equal physical capabilities of physical fitness than you but if you're stronger mentally you can push yourself past that pain barrier and then the opposite is true when i think if you have the physical fitness, you're actually training that resilience, that stress resilience in the gym, when you ski, when you're running, because you're also pushing yourself past that pain threshold. Now it's a different pain, potentially, those the kinds of mental pains or stresses that you have compared to physical, but I believe there is great crossover there. Um, and I've certainly found that, so I've done several races now, and when I did my last marathon, 
one of the things I was thinking about were the children, because I did it for Great Ormond Street Hospital, were the children I met at the hospital when I was there. Now, I'm not saying that's a stress, but that is an emotion I use to spur myself on. Um, and I think when you touched upon values before, this is like an aha moment. When you, if you're trying to embody those values, then you can actually better deal in my mind with the stresses that come your way because you're understanding the purpose of why you are acting the way you are does that make sense hopefully i've articulated that well yeah i i I really do think there is a i mean there must be a reason that in the military they get you extremely fit Mm -hmm. to be able to cope with combat stress um uh, so there must be a strong link between physical fitness and the ability to endure uh, mental strain and mental stress um, uh, and, and stop it bottling up. Um, if we can move on, because we, I know we're running out of time, Mark, unfortunately, yeah. because I'm very much <laughs> enjoying the conversation. Um, and I just wanted to say this before we move on to, to a few more questions is um, I'm very sorry to hear about the passing of your, your father and brother, especially during these times when you are a very busy CEO. And I, I know that all too well. I have three questions which I ask everyone that comes on the show, but one question before I ask those is, as a leader and a family man, has there been a major learning for you during this 20-ish months during the pandemic? Yes, and it's been been an extraordinary 20 months with all different ebbs and flows of it. But to me, I think the one thing that has stayed with me throughout is a strong desire for normality. Um, And and I hear people talking about um, the new normal. Um, My approach, pretty much from the first day of lockdown, um, where we had actually closed our offices two days before lockdown was announced, because I could see it coming. We could all see it coming. We all wanted to to stop commuting to be able to protect our our elderly relatives. That was kind of the thing at the time um, and lessen the risk to to our loved ones. Um, My approach all the way through has been there there will not be a new normal. This is a viral, nasty viral Mm -hmm. uh, issue, but it's still a viral disease. It's like the flu. It's like the cold. It has a damaging effect on certain cohorts of the nation, but not everybody. And we could seriously overreact to this. That was my non-scientific judgment. So when we went into lockdown as an organization, um, all we, all I focused the team on quickly was A, giving them something to, to focus on. So we decided to create an online conference, which we'd never done before. Um, and we pivoted from a face-to-face to online in in a couple of months and delivered it superbly well. The team were fantastic, um, but it gave them a real tough challenge to keep them occupied. But we kept saying from that first virtual Zoom staff meeting and the first week, when we get back to the office, when we get back to the office, and I kept hammering that point. And the very first day that we were allowed to reopen, which I think was in the middle of June, 2020, so about three months later, we reopened the office. We did the risk assessments. Uh, it didn't make it compulsory for people to come back. We went to flexible working, but I was the first person through that door on the Monday morning um, in the middle of June and pretty much stayed there until there was the other break at the beginning of, of this year. And we've never really closed our office apart from those couple of months. Mm-hmm. And it's a desire to say there will not be a new normal because what we were doing before was creative. And, well, and I'm talking as our organization. Yes. We, we had built we were fortunately we transitioned towards um the year before we'd started transitioning to a concept of of teams within a team where i was moving myself down from being the kind of top-down ceo to being in the middle of a of a a hive of matrix teams Uh, and my role was to train to coordinate to empower and, uh, and create the culture where all of these little teams could work together in bigger teams as part of our big team. So we were on that journey already. So dispersing all over the country to homes didn't matter because we were already working as kind of a, in this dispersed team model. Um, and the last thing I wanted to do was say, well, coming out of that, that doesn't work anymore. 
because it was working and it was working very well. And out of that, we got creativity, we got productivity, we got innovation, mm -hmm. uh, we got relationships forming, uh, friendships forming, which you can't do online. So the first opportunity we had to all come back, everybody came back to work in the office. I didn't have to order people to come back. They all came back because they want to be together. You know, human beings are inherently social animals. They, they like that interaction. And people who used to say, oh, it's so much more efficient working at home, it used to take three days to solve one finance problem. And now we can do it in 15 minutes because we're all in the building together. So I don't believe there's a new normal, certainly for our organization. Mm -hmm. We're just better at what we were doing before because we've used that dispersed model to enhance teamwork. Um, so I, does that kind of answer where you were going? That, that to me was the, was the fundamental lesson that don't get carried away and think you've got to reinvent everything because I don't think you have to. I think that makes a lot of sense. So yes, it completely does answer the question. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> and we are coming up on time marks, but I have okay. three final quick questions for you. And the first one is, what is the most impactful health change that you have made in your life and why? Um, that's a fairly easy one. It was about three years ago. Yeah, three years ago, the summer of 2019. Um, and I transitioned from very much a running based fitness regime um, of running between five and 10 K distances in between two, three times a week. Um, and I, I don't know if you were at the winter meeting that we had a few years ago. Um, and one of the uh, lectures uh, was on muscle in elderly people. Um, and the case study was a man called Charles used uh, Eugster, uh, E U G S T R, S T E R, um, a man from Switzerland who won the 100 meter sprint at the age of 97 for, for the senior age group. And the person who, who presented had worked with him um, because at the age of about 75, 80, he went to the gym and said, I want a beach body. Now, he was aerobically fit because he was a rower, mm -hmm. um, but as a dentist and kind of a, a, a medical individual, um, he didn't believe he had a robust enough body to survive another 20 years. So he shifted to a weight training based, resistance training based model um, and less aerobic work. Um, and he wrote a book about his experiences in his early 90s called Age is Just a Number. Uh, and I read that book over my summer holiday and became enthralled by it and decided to uh, to shift in my late 50s to that resistance-based model. And I'm still on that journey now, but gosh, I am now bench pressing weights that I was not able to bench press when I was in the Air Force, because it's progressive. Yeah. Um, last week, I, I, I beat my pull-up record. I did 10 pull-ups. Well, a year ago, I couldn't pull myself up once. So it That's proves amazing. that even at the age of 60, with the right approach to protein and diet and being sensible, um, and a focus on two or three trips to the gym per week with the right training program behind you, mm -hmm. not just randomly going in and doing things, but there's a structure to it. I got a very, very good book by Matt Roberts, the personal trainer. I mean, half the book was just... Uh, of no interest to me but the diagrams and the around the exercises to do in the gym mm -hmm. moved me past that what on earth is that machine for moment <laughs> <laughs> to which everyone uh, to has a, to be fair as, yeah, yeah and being slightly intimidated by the gym to now um to, to now be able to go in there and have a variety of exercises that work the whole body so and i feel so much better and again resilient i think but in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. I'm more flexible. I sleep better. Um, I've still got a little bit of fat around the middle, but I think that's, I've got to give up the wine to get rid of that. And that perhaps it's not going <laughs> to happen quite so quickly. <laughs> 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 um, but gosh, yeah, even I can now see differences in the mirror, you know, which I think is that big. To me, you don't stand on the scale, you stand naked in front of the mirror. That's the true test of, um, of what your body is like. So, so yeah, that would be my big one. Resistance training, huge for me. Brilliant. Love it. Um, second one is how can healthcare, and this might be quite hard to answer given what we've just spoken yeah. about, but I will ask it anyway. Yeah. Um, how can our healthcare implement some of the strategies that we have spoken about today? 
Yeah, that is a tough one. Um, I mean, I think it's probably, if there's a role, it's around education um, of, of the many dangers, but also the benefits and the ease in, in which some of this can be done, but also the education around it's not a quick fix. Mm -hmm. you know, Charles in his book spoke about not seeing really a physical difference or feeling a difference for a year before he began to think, well, this is actually working. So there is no quick fix. And, um, you know, and that, that lovely saying from Zig Ziglar, you didn't get fat taking pills from a bottle and you're not going to get slim taking pills from a bottle. I, I think it's kind of relevant. Um, but educating people to know that the gym is there. Um, mm. Is there a role for healthcare and perhaps providing better access um, uh, to facilities than we have? I live in a town that's very good for that. We mm -hmm. have a swimming pool next door, which has a gym, which has a sauna. Um, and a number of, when my brother was very ill with his spondylitis, he was given free swimming lessons by his by his care supporters. Mm -hmm. um, he never took them, which is probably one of his issues he was challenged. But there is a beginning of a system of supporting personal responsibility. Um, and if healthcare can encourage that self-discipline to be self-responsible and self-reliant and the facilities are there and they're easy to get to and there's easily understandable knowledge that the average person can read without having to have a degree in nutritional science um, or physical training then i think that would be a big step forward I and mean, it's a huge issue across multiple departments uh, mm -hmm. um, but it's got to start somewhere i mean even that that piece just to add to that sorry on um, stress resilience and um, even like promoting stress resilience within healthcare, I think would be key just because you can see even on um, there's an association between like psychiatry and like depression and things of that nature. So I think dealing with those stresses and maybe access to those kinds of therapies would be massive as well. And um, just as you said, the access to kind of nutrition interventions and exercise um, should be accessible to everyone and be promoted, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a cash payback eventually because a healthier nation is not going to succumb to COVID mm -hmm. as much if it did, if it came around again. The Absolutely. burden on the health service would go down dramatically and we would all lead, we probably all need less um, care because you know, Charles is brilliant piece in his book. He's opening two pages. Uh, he, he, he painted this picture of a circle of people sitting in armchairs with one TV amongst them in a care home, all staring at the television, staring at each other. And he said, I don't want to be that person. I want to be able to be self-resilient and look after myself as best as I can. But it's, it's, it's going to be me that's going to get me there. The health system will not do that for me. I have got to get off my seat and take that first step and uh, personal responsibility. Self-empowerment truly inspirational yeah. yeah good phrase yeah yeah um and the last question mark is can you please provide the listeners with three quick tips and i know you've provided many already to help improve their health and well-being from today yeah i was going to be a little flippant and say uh, do it <laughs> yeah you should smoke cigars because you know they're plant-based they're gluten-free <laughs> zero calories <laughs> but I, I might just keep that one to myself uh, but they're very trendy of course with those um now i would i would go back my first one i, I suggest we go back to a car totally and, and live in the now um and and then expand that into my second point by saying you know seeking to enjoy every thing that we do every experience whether it's the run the gym the meal you're eating, the glass of wine, the podcast, reading that chapter of the book, um, just enjoying it for its experience and stop this myth that you can multitask because you can only really, the brain can only focus on one thing at a time, but get, but you'll get the maximum from that um, if you don't try and multitask. And my last one is, uh, it goes back to, to nutrition in my early days at a conference, and I won't name the scientists, but I was overwhelmed as a non-nutritionist being at a conference. Uh, I, I likened it to being stuck in a bad episode of a Big Bang Theory. I was just there. I had no idea what was going on around me. And I'd sat through umpteen lectures on, I think it was on obesity and, uh, and diabetes and a few other things. Didn't understand much of it. And I, 
afterwards I went to this senior academic and said um, that I just I don't think I'm ever going to understand this that this just sounds so complicated no wonder health is such an issue there must be a way to stop um, obesity or fight obesity and he looked at me and said never quote me on this by name but the answer is moderation in everything and we would cure most of the problems if that could happen and you know you only have one life so enjoy it so yes have a glass of wine yes have a scotch but have a scotch not three scotches um, moderation in everything but enjoy everything by living in the moment that to me kind of sums up those three I think that's great. It reminds me of a, I, I interviewed an oncologist quite some time ago. He hasn't been on the podcast. Um, but one thing that he said to me is like, don't stay up late um, unless it's very pre- pleasurable. Meaning like, and he was talking about drinking alcohol, et cetera, and being with friends. And he was been like, unless it's very sociable or pleasurable, don't stay up late. And I thought that was like brilliant because so many people stay up late watching mind numbing Netflix right? And not in a social environment and actually creating and culturing those kinds of memories, uh, which make your life so much better and is um, nurturing those friendships. And so, yeah, that's something that I try and uh, and do in my daily life or remember in my daily life, but don't always quite get there. Sometimes I'm late at night watching Suits, but that is to my own detriment. Um, (laughs) Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, but before you go, can you please tell the listeners where they can find you and what exciting projects you have coming up? Um, Yes, Uh, you can find me on um, uh, on Instagram um, and Twitter. Um, I'm not hugely outwardly active on Twitter. Uh, I'm transitioning more to Instagram. I find it uh, um, I find it a better platform. Um, my email is on the, um, uh, the Nutrition Society website, which of course Nutrition Society um, uh, dot org, and my um, my Instagram uh, address uh, or handle, as I think it's called, is is N Society underscore CEO. And you can find me uh, growing slowly on um, uh, on that platform, and um, and then there's various ways through my address you can find me on, on WhatsApp. Um, and I guess the big exciting project for us now is is getting back into conferences. We held our first hybrid conference this week, uh, Nutrition Futures. We live streamed in people. We had delegates from all over the world. It worked. It was fabulous to have a hundred people back in a conference facility again. So we're we're progressing on with that. Is that sustainable? I don't know. Is it the future? I don't know. Um, but we are fully embracing it for the moment and we'll evaluate it as, uh, as we go along. And I'm looking forward to getting back to traveling and getting around the world and rebuilding all of those fabulous friendships and relationships across nutrition science that I've made over the last six or seven years. Um, and that will all probably start chaotically, I'm sure, in 2022. I'll never be here. <laughs> Perfect. I will link to everything that you've just spoken about in the show notes for the listeners. Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure, but I don't have to tell you that. Yeah. I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and um, I hope you have too. And I do hope that we get the chance to do this again soon. Yeah, it's good to catch up. Thanks, Ben. Thank you for listening to the Functional Health Podcast. You can find links to everything that we talked about today in the show notes. If you have a second, please consider leaving a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does make a huge difference and helps get this valuable information out and reach more people. Don't forget to subscribe so you can stay up to date and know whenever I release a new episode. You can connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, or our website, and all questions are welcome. As always, thanks to Joss Aurelia for all the editing, and thank you all for your support.